Was your parents involved in the law at all? Was that something that came natural to you? Uh, no, my parents were not involved in law. They do have roots right here in western Pennsylvania, though. They grew up just up the road uh, in the suburbs of uh, western Pennsylvania. Neither one of them graduated from college, but they always emphasized the importance of education. And as a result, I never attended my neighborhood schools in Washington, D.C. And starting at a pretty young age, I traveled from far southeast D.C., east of the Anacostia River, way to upper northwest D.C., the most privileged segment of Washington. And um, you know, had my parents not uh, prioritized education in that way, I'm quite confident I would not have written this book or be talking to you here today. Do you reflect on that when you, as you write about the schoolhouse gate, about the Supreme Court and the intersection of constitutional rights for students, that really those were decisions made by your parents. Yeah, well, uh, I feel like I did a really good job of selecting my parents, you know. <laughs> uh, they uh, supported me in incredible ways. I tell a story in the acknowledgments to the book that um, my father did uh, leave home in the wee hours of one morning in order to sleep in his car uh, outside of Alice Deal Junior High School in order to make sure that he was going to be the first in the queue uh, for out-of-district students. And, um, you know, that story should be simultaneously inspiring and depressing. Inspiring because it's a testament to what a committed set of parents can do on behalf of a, of a youngster, but on the other hand, it's depressing in the sense that uh, it shouldn't require a superhuman effort on the part of parents in order to get their child access to quality education. So I am unbelievably grateful to them. If I could, uh, well, before I get to that, and just kind of your biography, because I think this is so cool that you touched and your career after law school, Merrick Garland, mm -hmm. Judge Garland, mm -hmm. who had, um, uh, of course, a really distinguished career. But I'd like to know your reaction because he became quite a, a news story for a while. Right. right. Yeah, uh, I was very lucky to be a law clerk to Judge Garland um, on the D.C. Circuit. Um, I learned immensely from him. I think of him as a friend today. And I was delighted when he was nominated by President Obama to fill the seat uh, that was vacated by Justice Scalia and obviously uh, just, um, you know, gutted to see that he never received a hearing. Um, he is uh, intelligent um, and has uh, impeccable uh, sort of standards, uh, moral and otherwise, and would have made a fabulous Supreme Court justice, and it is a real shame in my estimation that uh, the norms were abandoned in, in that regard. How did you get that position? That's a coveted position to be a clerk for a circuit court judge. Yeah. How does this happen? Well, uh, I was lucky to have some uh, good mentors in law school who saw that uh, they thought that I had some potential, and um, you know, the truth is I also had uh, friends that were in uh, good places in the chambers who were kind enough to select my application out of the thousands and say, Judge, you should see this guy. And um, I am extremely grateful to those friends. Um, that was one of the most humbling experiences that I've ever had, was when I was with Judge Garland, and you get just this you know, unbelievable number of applications from incredibly qualified people, and they would no doubt be able to uh, do the job in a good way, and then you're selecting four people out of uh, an avalanche of applications. So, uh, you know, uh, you know, fate really did uh, smile on me when I was with Judge Garland because, uh, you know, he uh, will take a draft from a law clerk and you sort of feel happy if a, if a clause or two make it into the final draft and everything. And I say that because 
he's doing his own work, he makes the opinion his own, and that's the, where the real learning comes in. If you're simply drafting an opinion for a judge and then it goes right into the F-third, um, there's not as much back and forth, and um, his process is one that I try to mimic as best as I can with my own work product and the way that I work with research assistants where um, it's a very interactive process. So, you know, you're working with a small group of people and that's what you do as a, as a law professor as well. So, boy, he's, he's the best. I learned so much from him. You are a law professor, yet at Harvard you probably had a few that were standouts mm -hmm. uh, in your world, uh, maybe in the constitutional law world. Where yeah. there, there are a couple you want to mention by name? Sure. Uh, yeah, I'll focus on one in particular. Uh, Professor Randall Kennedy of Harvard Law School is, uh, he, was a, he was a wonderful teacher and you know, we all borrow from other uh, people that we encounter along the way, and I borrow a lot from Professor Kennedy in the sense that um, one of his ways of conducting class would be to make some argument, uh, hopefully that's provocative, and then say, tell me why I'm wrong, right? And he meant that in the sense that he liked engaging and thinks of that as an essential part of the academic enterprise, to offer an idea and then to refine it. And then whenever I give talks, I also borrow from uh, Professor Kennedy where he says at the end of the time that he welcomes questions, comments, and objections, right? And that is a really wonderful way to put it because it suggests that this is a conversation rather than the professor who's holding on from high, on high and uh, declaiming. Uh, instead, he wants to mix it up. And so um, he's, uh, he was a wonderful instructor when I had him at Harvard and again has really encouraged me along the way. The editor of my book uh, is a guy called Errol McDonald who's worked with Randy on his books and that's no accident that I'm with uh, Errol McDonald of Pantheon and they did a really nice job with this book. So you have uh, uh, Professor Kennedy who clerked for Thurgood Marshall. Mm -hmm. Do you see sort of a, a thread of a Marshall impact on Kennedy that may have an impact on Driver? Hmm. Well, boy, uh, I hold uh, Justice Marshall in incredibly high esteem. I grew up in Washington, D.C. And I can remember looking at the Supreme Court of the United S States and thinking that's an impressive building and also thinking that a really impressive person is working in that building in part for his jurisprudence but also because of his litigation work with the NAACP. Um, you know, there's no lawyer that is more central to the quest for racial equality than Justice Marshall. So I do sometimes think uh, that I've uh, you know, shaken hands with Randy Kennedy and surely at some point he shook hands with uh, Thurgood Marshall and so that puts me just one handshake away. Um, I would not be so bold as to claim that, uh, you know, Thurgood Marshall's work, uh, you know, is um, sort of infused in the book, but he is an essential person in my life and um, uh, I'd like to think that I'm uh, trying to live up to the standard, but I wouldn't be so bold as to claim that I am doing so. You then find your way uniquely, uh, sort of a trifecta when the day is done. Uh, you clerk for Justice O'Connor, a Chautauquan, by the way, and also Justice Breyer. How did that all work? Yeah. So, yeah, I was able to clerk for two different justices. Um, that was simultaneously while Justice O'Connor was a retired justice and Justice Breyer was an active justice. And it was a wonderful experience, and both of them shape the book in significant ways. That is to say, when I was with Justice O'Connor, she was beginning to think about work promoting civics education for youngsters and through her iCivics program. And I view this book as uh, carrying on that tradition. That is to say that she was focused on separation of powers and you know, federalism and these sort of foundational uh, concepts of our constitutional order. And one of the animating visions of my book is to think about meeting students where they live, that is to say, uh, saying that they have rights within the public schools. And my hope is that by identifying their free speech rights on an everyday context, 
that this book will hope to serve as a gateway into thinking about some of these larger questions about constitutional law. So that's Justice O'Connor. I hold her in incredibly high esteem. She was kind enough to marry uh, my wife and me, and uh, she's a really warm person. Uh, Justice Breyer, of course, I hold in high esteem as well. When I was with him, uh, two major cases were decided that I write about in the book. This is the parents involved in community schools case that deals with really the legacy of Brown versus Board of Education and then also Morse versus Frederick, uh, which nobody calls Morse versus Frederick, but instead everyone calls it bong hits for Jesus. Mm -hmm. uh, and so uh, he wrote in both of those opinions and he dedicated a lot of energy to those opinions and it was, it underscored for me the way that these cases are not some sort of add-ons, but instead are important for thinking about foundational concepts in our constitutional order. When I told uh, Justice Breyer that I was working on this book, he started removing his watch, and I thought he was doing this in a sort of absent-minded professor way. Um, and uh, when it, it, then it became clear that he was turning over the watch, and it was the watch that the San Francisco School Board bestowed upon his uh, Justice Breyer's father after many years of service. And it was Justice Breyer's way of saying, uh, this is really valuable work and this affects people in their everyday lives and I'm glad that you're taking up this project. It's worthy of your intellectual energy. And parents involved, of which uh, was you, you cited in your book as probably uh, Justice Breyer's probably most important, albeit a dissent opinion, really was a continuation of cases. And I'm looking at the map in the front of the book, which I, I was immediately intrigued, and you see my highlighting, where if you could, let's, let, if you don't mind, kind of walk this through this ge genealogy of s school cases dealing with students, uh, maybe for the benefit of the students, but also for the camera, starting with gabitis. Mm -hmm. uh, and maybe just a little a little bit of behind the case itself. Yeah, Gobitis is where I open the book, actually. Um, this is a case from 1940 where there are students who are Jehovah's Witnesses and they wish not to recite the Pledge of Allegiance because they believe that it interferes with their religious faith. And the question is, can uh, they be required to salute upon penalty of expulsion? And Justice Frankfurter writes the opinion for the court, and he uh, upholds the legitimacy of this practice as that it doesn't violate the Constitution in order to expel the students. And one of his primary justifications for doing so is that he fears that getting involved in this arena will turn the Supreme Court into the school board for the nation. This is supposed to be a horrific thought. Um, he says, in effect, that we are judges, we are not teachers, and we don't know about this area, and so we don't have the expertise to be involved here. And that is a long-standing fear. It's one that the Supreme Court would eventually shake off, and um, that is a pivotal moment because the movement from the Gobitis decision upholding this practice to three short, year, three short years later invalidating this practice in Barnett suggests that the Supreme Court has a special responsibility to vindicate students' constitutional rights. So that really, was that one of the first kind of discussions regarding students' rights vis-a-vis -vis the, in this case, the First Amendment? Yeah, there are other cases, uh, previous cases. Um, one might think about the coming decision from 1899 where Justice Harlan is writing. Uh, you can think about the Gong Lum decision uh, dealing with in 1927 out of Mississippi, also thinking about issues revolving racial segregation. And then there are uh, there was an important trilogy of cases dealing with assimilation in the 1920s that are more about private schools rather than public schools. Uh, but nevertheless, students' rights are animated there in the sense that it becomes clear that the federal judiciary will not say that states can do whatever they wish whenever it comes to education. Um, the two most famous cases there would be Pierce versus Society of Sisters and Meyer versus Nebraska. 1943, the Supreme Court takes up virtually the same case. This happens to be West Virginia, uh, West Virginia versus Barnett. Yeah. 
Uh, want, to, want to talk about that? I'd love to. Uh, it's one of my favorite cases in all of constitutional law. It's an opinion, uh, as you say, raising a similar, if not identical, question to the one in Gobitis. Can schools uh, throw out students for refusing to cite the Pledge of Allegiance. Justice Jackson, of course, writes the opinion for the court uh, that reverses the go decision, and it is one of, if not the most magnificently written opinions uh, in all of the U.S. reports. Jackson says um, that if there is any fixed star in our constitutional constellation, it is that no official, high or petty, can prescribe what shall be orthodox. That is, uh, you know, one of my favorite sentences. And people have suggested that one of the beauties of the sentence is that, one of the beautiful aspects of the sentence is that um, uh, he is almost appealing to a sense of patriotism when he says, if there's any fixed star, the star that he has in mind, some people have suggested, are the stars on the American flag. And that in effect, it would be un-American to require students to pledge allegiance to the American flag. And this is known as the prohibition on compulsory speech, something that has had implications well beyond the schoolhouse. Um, you know, there are many aspects of the opinion that I really admire. Let me tell you about a couple. One is Jackson's reconceptualization of the right in question. Rather than viewing this as being a question about the freedom of religion, he instead views it as about the freedom of speech. And he says that the freedom of speech, in effect, involves a corollary negative right, the freedom not to speak, uh, and we need to honor that. So that is a way of saying that this is not some sort of special right for some religious minorities, but instead is about a freedom of conscience that everyone enjoys. Another part about the opinion is the sheer timing of it. It's 1943, at the height of World War II, at a time when patriotic sentiment is running incredibly high, and at the time, Schools in all 48 states are expelling students for refusing to salute the American flag. Uh, three years earlier, at the time of go schools in just 15 different states were doing this. So this is a testament to the way that schools can vindicate minority rights uh, in a way that's efficacious. Right? Sometimes people claim, well, when the court tries to defend minority rights, they end up making matters worse, or they're futile, uh, they can't do so, and that's false. Uh, and so uh, Barnett is a really important opinion for that proposition. That, uh, just as for the benefit of the students, um, for those who are interested, last year at the Jackson Center we celebrated the 75th anniversary of the Barnett case and I had a chance to interview Marie Barnett uh, and kind of what a child was thinking of at the time and it's just incredibly fascinating. Uh, of their religious beliefs and how that, that became a reality. And uh, that case, in fact, one of your constitutional law professors, Cass Sunstein, uh, at Harvard, deemed this case to be the most profound Supreme Court case ever. Mm -hmm. uh, and then in the, the next case of real moment, uh, probably the one most everybody's aware of, is Brown versus Board of Education. Uh, we had Again, personal note, we have Linda Brown and her sister at the Jackson Center. Uh, maybe, could you just highlight that perhaps again for the students, you're the greatest, you're a great professor. This is fantastic. <laughs> I love it. Uh, oh, sure, happy to do so. So Brown is a case from 1954 that raises the constitutionality of racial segregation in schools. Chief Justice Warren writes the opinion for the court invalidating what we refer to as de jure segregation as distinct from de facto segregation, maybe so-called de facto segregation might be the right way to put that. And uh, it's a unanimous decision and the decision is uh, perhaps the most celebrated in all of American constitutional law. Then Judge Kavanaugh said during his confirmation hearings that it was the most important decision that the Supreme Court's ever issued, more so even than Marbury versus Madison. And it's a deeply ambiguous opinion as to what it actually holds. Uh, and in that ambiguity plays no small role in the widespread, if not universal, approval of Brown versus Board of Education. Uh, you know, uh, there, Brown set off a fierce debate to control the meaning of Brown, and people said, uh, does Brown require 
integration or does it merely forbid segregation? And that's a distinction that is a very uh, sort of lawyerly one that lawyers could uh, appreciate. Um, and over time, it's my claim that the meaning of Brown was tamed uh, so that uh, not only does, is, are these, these days, Brown is understood not only to not require integration, but properly understood, some people would say that Brown forbids racial integration, at least if school districts are using racial classifications to achieve racial integration. Um, so it is um, a great decision. Uh, it is also one that I try to offer some revisionist uh, account, a revisionist account of where I cast doubt on the unanimity of Brown and why that was so important. Uh, and so it, it is a case that I enjoy teaching every time I come across it and each time I read it I see something uh, different. It's a very short opinion uh, but it's almost like oh, I don't know, some sort of prism that you turn and you can refract it and see the opinion through different angles. The acts, there's no remedy in Brown one. Uh, they kicked it can down the road for the next year, Brown versus Board two, uh, and with all deliberate speed. Did, in in context, did the court do the right thing at that time, or did it create such ambiguity that it led to a whole 1950s, 60s? Yeah. It's a really good question and it's difficult to know the answer. One of the claims that I make in the book is that it's understandable that Brown II did not have sort of more teeth than it actually did. I try to put myself in the shoes and the reader in the shoes of Chief Justice Warren who was called to the White House by President Eisenhower as Brown I is pending and he uh, is hosting him for a dinner relatively small dinner party and Warren is seated in very close proximity to John W. Davis who argued the case on behalf of the South Carolina school district trying to defend racial segregation and as they are uh, departing from one room to another President Eisenhower puts his arms around Davis and Warren and Ike says you have to understand these southerners are not bad people they just don't want their little girls sitting alongside some big black bucks, right? This is incredibly uh, offensive language that is giving voice to the idea of black males as some sort of sexual predators. And if you are Chief Justice Warren at this time, this has to give you grave doubts as to if you order desegregation to a quarter, to, to order forthwith, meaning immediately, that President Eisenhower is going to back that decision. And so I can understand uh, Chief Justice Warren having crafted Brown II as he did, which does have some language that goes a bit further than all deliberate speed. My real sort of beef with uh, the Warren court is not so much with Brown II, but the failure to act after the Little Rock desegregation crisis when it becomes clear that President Eisenhower will support the Supreme Court, including, uh, you know, with the 101st Airborne, and of course after President Eisenhower has secured re-election. And even if you set aside the Eisenhower presidency, think about the Kennedy presidency and the Johnson presidency, where there would be little doubt that the Supreme, pardon me, that the President would back the Supreme Court. And the, the inaction the relative silence of the Supreme Court is the real scandal here. Their, their, their silence is deafening over the nine years of the Johnson and Kennedy administration. And it seems to me that that's the real problem, the failure to uh, require racial integration in the South and the North for that matter. One of the claims in the book is that uh, racial segregation is uh, not a regional problem, but an American problem. So how did it find itself, you know, obviously the Supreme Court can only act when there is certiorari granted and there's a case that comes to it that, that that sort of inactivity malaise in the Supreme Court come because they did not grant certiorari? Is that That's exactly right. They, uh, in effect, decided to allow the lower courts to figure this matter out, um, including there were cases from the North 
uh, dealing with what people refer to as de facto segregation, including cases out of Gary, Indiana, when the federal courts, the federal appellate courts are wrestling with the right rule to hand down and in my view they really could have used some guidance from the Supreme Court in order to uh, elide the distinction between de jure segregation and de facto segregation and so the court doesn't get involved in this area in a high profile way until 1969 in the Green decision out of uh, Virginia when they finally say the time for all deliberate speed has come to a close uh, and that they say that the school district needs to come up with policies that are going to work and that they're going to work now. But of course, that's at the very tail end of Chief Justice Warren's tenure. And uh, President, I, President Eisenhower, uh, Nixon is elected in 1968. And of course, in short and rapid succession, he gets four appointees to the court. And um, that's the beginning of the end of what could have been a robust understanding of Brown versus Board of Education. Just for, on a sidebar, we talk about certiorari, we should have explained that. Uh, when there is uh, appellate courts and there's disputes and there's an application to the Supreme Court for the Supreme Court to hear it, uh, they don't have to hear it. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's a decision for, is it four? It's justices? four, that's right. Four justices have to decide to hear the case. Of course, it takes five to win. Uh, and that's what's the certiorari part aspect. So I apologize, we kind of blew right through that. Um, 1969, you talk about that date, and that's also the date of uh, Tinker, uh, of interest to everybody here. Mary Beth was just at the Jackson Center. Uh, so could you explain that a little bit? Sure, yeah, so Tinker uh, is, grows out of a dispute in 1965, where in December of that year, there are students who want to wear black armbands to school in protest of the Vietnam War. School officials get wind of this plan and they say, oh no, that is too hot button of a topic. It's worth saying that December 1965 is before the rise of mass mobilization against the Vietnam War. And the school officials also say with some force that there's a graduate of a Des Moines high school who died over in Vietnam and if you wear these black armbands to school, his buddies who are still here will view you as dishonoring his memory and indeed his sacrifice. Uh, and so the question is, when the school officials say you can't wear these black armbands, uh, does that violate their First Amendment rights? The Tinker, Mary Beth, and her brother John, and some others. And it's a really important moment. And it's far from clear what the answer is at the time. Chief, uh, pardon me, Justice Fortas writes the opinion for the court and he finds that students do retain freedom of speech uh, when they are in public schools. And it's a wonderful opinion, and indeed it gives me the title for my book. Uh, Fortas says, it can hardly be argued that students shed their constitutional rights at the schoolhouse gate. One of the nice moves in the opinion is that he reconceptualizes the role of students in a democratic society. He says that ours is a relatively open, often disputatious society, and it would be odd if schools didn't have that same sort of clamor and disagreement, and I think he almost has Tocqueville in mind when he talks about the, the disagreement that characterizes American society. He says that, uh, Fortas says that when students speak to one another on the issue of the day, that's not a distraction, but instead a vital part of the educational process. This led to a vehement dissenting opinion from Justice Hugo Black, uh, where he said that students are there to be seen and not heard. Ours is too permissive of a society. There are young men with long hair these days and you know, the world's going to hell in a handbasket. So as if to underscore this idea about ours being a disputatious society, Justice Hugo Black spoke for more than 20 minutes from the bench um, and said, I want it known that I disavow any sentence, any word, any part of what the Supreme Court does today. He was fairly frothing at the mouth so much so that Chief Justice Warren is purported to have said, old Hugo really got caught up in his jockstrap on that one, right? 
And, you know, if he did get caught up in his jock strap, some people have said that it's because of an event from his personal life. He had a grandson out in New Mexico who produced an underground newspaper and uh, that was critical of school administrators and he was suspended. And uh, Hugo Black said that, uh, wrote a, a note to his daughter-in-law saying the school did exactly the right thing here. That's an irresistible anecdote to include and I included in my book, but I do try to emphasize that it's a mistake to view Black's descent as merely one elderly grandfather's fit of peak. Instead, um, it seems to me that his views were more consistent with most Americans than those offered in the majority by Justice Fortas. I found polling data that suggested that uh, only a minority of people would have agreed with Justice Fortas's opinion. And that, again, is a testament to, way, to the way that the Supreme Court can successfully vindicate minority rights. This is an aside, and uh, you as being a constitutional law scholar, and you think of some of the liberal justices during the uh, Roosevelt Truman time period, you think of, of Douglas and Black, and yet this seems to be pretty uh, unnecessarily a liberal, liberalized view. It's true, you know, Justice Black does have a much vaunted reputation for being a defender of the freedom of speech and um, at the end of his time on the court he started to have real skepticism of civil rights demonstrators and uh, the tinkers including Mary Beth said that she identified herself as sort of carrying on the legacy of student protest and so uh, you know toward the end of his time on the court he started to become uneasy with some of this speech, and he would regard this as not speech at all, and therefore not deserving, uh, you know, uh, protection. And so, in many ways, uh, Hugo Black can be understood as being emblematic of the Roberts Court, at least when it comes to student speech. That is to say, that Chief Justice Roberts has declared himself the fiercest advocate of the freedom of speech, yet in the area of, uh, of the freedom of speech, I should say, but in the area of student speech, the Roberts Court has fallen down in its responsibility. And so even if they are generally uh, enamored of the freedom of speech, indeed some people would say rather too enamored of the freedom of speech, in the area of student speech, uh, the Roberts Court's uh, uh, defense is, is, is missing in action. Tinker is still good law, but there's been, it's been eroded by a variety of exceptions or, it, can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, uh, in, uh, Tinker was the greatest moment for student speech in the Supreme Court and uh, the subsequent decisions have carved out a series of exceptions. Uh, the most recent of those was one that I mentioned a while back called the Bong Hits for Jesus case. There student named Joseph Frederick, an 18-year-old high school senior, brings a banner near the school. Uh, uh, he's in Juneau, Alaska, and the Olympic torch is making its way down Glacier Avenue in Juneau, Alaska. And Joseph Frederick positions himself directly across the street from the school. Many teachers have allowed their classes to, mo to witness this momentous event and Joseph Frederick unfurls this 14-foot long banner that reads, Bong Hits for Jesus. And so the principal sees the banner, marches across the street, snatches the banner out of his hands, and then proceeds to suspend him. And the question is, can this, uh, you know, pass uh, constitutional muster? And Chief Justice Roberts wrote an opinion saying that if the teacher reasonably believes that the speech in question is designed to promote illicit drug use, then it's permissible to punish the student for the speech. That's unusual from a First Amendment perspective because it's, uh, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's not viewpoint neutral. Uh, generally speaking, we require uh, you know, uh, neutrality when it comes to viewpoint. You can't silence one side of the debate without silencing the other. So that's a recent instance of an erosion. Before that, there was a case called Hazelwood versus Kuhlmeyer dealing with uh, st uh, student speech in this context for a school newspaper where the court legitimated a principal's effort to uh, silence uh, student speech through the newspaper. And before that, it was a case involving uh, a student called Matthew Frazier, who at a school assembly gets up and gives a lewd speech, a speech that's filled with sexual innuendo in nominating his buddy to the student council. And uh, the court says that if there is uh, lewd speech is involved, and tinker is not the appropriate standard. And so 
I uh, think it was a wonderful day. In my view, it didn't go far enough, uh, but in subsequent decades, the court has been uh, reluctant to uh, build upon Tinker. You were at both the case dealing with parents involved and with uh, long hits for Jesus. To talk a little bit about being a clerk in that scenario. Did you attend the arguments? Did you sit down with Justice Breyer afterwards? How did that work? Yeah, being a law clerk at the Supreme Court of the United States was a great privilege. Uh, you know, uh, Justice Breyer, as I said, really cared about those cases a great deal. Um, I did attend the oral arguments. Um, uh, you know, uh, Justice Breyer uh, wrote a very long dissenting opinion in the parents involved case, and maybe I'll speak about that one. The question there was, there were these uh, school boards in Louisville and Seattle that adopted voluntary integration programs where um, they would say that if we assign students simply to their neighborhood schools as a result of the persistence of residential segregation we will have racially isolated schools and so in order to make the schools reflect the rich racial diversity of our cities we're going to classify students according to race in order to bring them together the question is whether this violates in many ways brown versus board of education Chief Justice Roberts writes an opinion uh, which results in the invalidation of these programs. And he says that in effect, this is a replay of Brown. Brown versus Board of Education invalidated regimes that told students where they could go to school based on the color of their skin. These programs in Louisville and Seattle, according to Chief Justice Roberts, uh, you know, tell students where they can go to school based on the color of their skin. It matters not one whit for constitutional purposes for Chief Justice Roberts that these programs are designed to bring people together and that in the bad old days the programs were designed to keep people apart and, I should say, keep black people and people of color systematically subordinated. Uh, my old boss, uh, Justice Breyer, wrote a very long in my unbiased view, wholly convincing dissenting opinion, uh, where he said that to compare Topeka, Kansas of the 1950s to Louisville and Seattle of today is a cruel distortion of history. Um, and he offered what might be viewed as an integrationist conception of the 14th Amendment and Brown versus Board of Education. That view did not carry the day uh, Justice Breyer has said it's his most important dissenting opinion that he's written in his you know, decades on the Supreme Court. I heard him say that when I was a visiting professor at Harvard Law School, and that was a really interesting moment for me. Because when you're a law clerk, you're only there for one year. You know, you, you know I could tell that he really cared about that opinion, and it was my sense that it occupied an unusual position of prominence throughout his career, but you don't really know. You only see one year, but to have him step back and say, no, that was a big one and that looms large in his minds for the decades was, uh, you know, a very interesting moment. For the benefit of the, the class, curious as to how did it work? You, you, did you brief him? Did you give brief notes to Justice Breyer ahead of time? Did you, you know, because it's voluminous briefs. Mm -hmm. You all probably read or maybe it was assigned within the office. Does, does he have kind of a crib notes as to maybe questions, suggested questions, or does he do that himself? Yeah. With Justice Breyer, uh, we did not propose questions. We would often give him a short memo identifying some of the major themes and you know, go through some of the amicus briefs. In that case, there were just so many amicus briefs and everything, and so you could give sort of a, a you know, survey the, the landscape for him. Um, but, you know, he, it was, he, he was very much driving things on this opinion. This was an all hands on deck sort of a deal here. This is the longest dissent that he has ever written. And in order to do that, he really did roll up his sleeves and understand the long history of 
race and racial segregation in both Louisville and Seattle. And one of the things that he does in that opinion is to elide this distinction between uh, de jure segregation and de facto segregation in the sense that uh, Seattle, when you really roll up your sleeves, doesn't look all that different from uh, Louisville, Kentucky. Um, so. Uh, you know, each case works uh, somewhat differently. Um, he knew uh, the, the magnitude of that case and knew it uh, from when certiorari was granted the preceding term. He had identified that as one that he particularly cared about. Um, but yeah, you would discuss things with him in the normal course and there would be opportunities for all the law clerks to interact with him and to raise questions. And he was a wonderful boss for many reasons, including that he's very much uh, still a law professor in the sense that he welcomes disagreement and engagement and um, likes to discuss things. So he, he, was, he was really ideal. The justices, after they hear the arguments, shortly thereafter, within a day or so, have, have a conference. You're not invited. Correct. Nobody's invited. Uh, but then after the conferences are done, he goes back to chambers. Did he ever kind of bring you guys in and give you a little uh, a recap? You know, it's very funny that you ask that. Yeah, the justices are the only ones who are in the room itself where it's happening, right? Um, and. Uh, yeah, we would wait with bated breath to see uh, what was the outcome of the cases that we uh, really cared about. And you know, the truth is that different justices give uh, a more candid uh, description as to uh, what happens. And so, uh, you know, some justices I think give the give the G version and others give the, give the rated R version as to what actually happened and everything. But yeah, we would routinely wait and we would hear and then, you know, different stories would emerge from uh, different chambers and we were able to kind of piece together what happened. Uh, and sometimes there's, you know, a breakdown in communication even in the conference itself. And so sometimes the law clerks are making sure, uh, you know, everybody's on the same page before you begin the work of, of writing an opinion. It was, I have to say, just a really exhilarating year of, it's the greatest job that a, long, a, a young lawyer can have. Um, I did not forget a single day the immense privilege that it was to be working at the Supreme Court of the United States and could still walk up the front steps of the building in those days. And I remember Chief Justice Roberts saying that when he was going to argue a case, he would always get a lump in his throat. And I, you know, I identified with that. So yeah, so Rehnquist is a law clerk to Jackson the f during the first oral argument in Brown versus Board of Education. And he writes a memo uh, um, that has his initials at the bottom, and the title of the memo is something like a random thought on the segregation cases. And he writes there, he says something like, although I've been excoriated by my liberal colleagues, I think that Plessy versus Ferguson was right and should be reaffirmed. So this uh, is, he writes this in making this number up, 1952, somewhere around there, maybe 1950, I think it's 1952, maybe 1953. And um, he uh, is nominated to the Supreme Court of the United States in, in 1971. And as you might imagine, this is an uncomfortable memo to have out there at this time. Brown versus, a testament to the way that Brown versus Board of Education has quickly become sacrosanct, right? Where in order to be a lawyer in good standing, you have to pledge allegiance to Brown versus Board of Education. So what does he do? His initials are on the memo. And he claims, Rehnquist does, that the memo captured not his own views, uh, but the views of Justice Jackson, and that he was simply um, sort of recording Jackson's views uh, and that they did not offer his own views. Uh, ma many people find this explanation to uh, be unpersuasive uh, for many reasons, including that, uh, you know, Jackson is the, like the most eloquent Supreme Court justice ever in the idea that he needed a law clerk to write a memo so that he could communicate his thoughts to his fellow colleagues at conference, uh, which strike many people as improbable. That's not to say that Jackson viewed Brown versus Board of Education as an easy case. He certainly did not. Um, but most people 
for, for lots of reasons, think that this actually captured Rehnquist's views rather than, than, than those of Justice Jackson. Is, is there a message, a walk away, where you, other than going to the conclusion where you want these students to say, uh, if you don't get through the whole book, here's my message? Yeah. So one of the main take-home points is that the school has been the single most significant site of constitutional interpretation in the nation's history. I claim that it is especially important for the federal courts to honor students' constitutional rights precisely because it is uh, the first place that students have sustained exposure to governmental entities. And Jackson says that if we don't honor constitutional rights in schools, then we are going to teach our youth to discount constitutional principles as mere platitudes. And he says to, we risk strangling the free mind at its source. That is uh, incredibly evocative language, and I think that uh, Jackson is exactly correct. It's my claim that the Supreme Court did an honorable job in this area for a few decades, but in more recent years, it has fallen down in its responsibility. What will change that? It's a good question. Um, for some of the time that I wrote this book, I thought that my old boss, Judge Garland, was going to be Justice Garland, and uh, the personnel does matter in interpreting uh, constitutional rights. I do think, however, that all hope is not lost in this area. It's possible to cobble together a coalition of liberals and the libertarian inflected vision of constitutional law that is ascendant in some right-leaning circles to bring about reform in a few areas that I care about. I'll tell you them quickly. Freedom of speech. The, if you're a libertarian, of course, you have a skepticism of state authority. State can't do whatever it wishes. And so libertarians tend to like wide free speech. The Fourth Amendment is another area that I care about, thinking about suspicionless drug searches where students can be required to provide urine samples simply for participating in extracurricular activities. That should make a libertarian want to jump up and down and scream. And then the final area, and the one that I care the most about, is uh, the area of the Eighth Amendment, thinking about corporal punishment in public schools, which still exists in this great nation of ours. And it's, you'd be hard pressed to identify an area where the state is exercising dominion over individuals in a more profound way than when government school officials, in effect, are striking students with foreign objects. And so libertarians should despise corporal punishment. And so I do remain hopeful that the Supreme Court, evenly as it's currently comprised, will bring about reforms in these areas. In today's world, you, you, you read all about security being provided to schools, you know, to protect the students because of the, of the terrible things that have happened at various schools. So all of a sudden you have security guards. You have folks in the school system. They're observing. They're there. And, you know, that, then you get into this kind of zone of privacy yeah. of the students themselves. Uh, that balance, balancing act, do you have a sense of that? Yeah, it's a very important issue. One of the phrases that recurs in this area as people talk about our post-Columbine era and of course we need to think about not just Columbine but Newtown uh, and and also Florida right uh, thinking about Parkland and Marjorie Stoneman Douglas High School so these are incredibly high salience events I take school security very seriously and I suggest that uh, it does not violate the Fourth Amendment in order to have uh, metal detectors. Um, nevertheless, I'm also uh, distressed at the ubiquity of what's referred to as school resource officers. This is an Orwellian term, if ever there were one. These are uniformed police officers who are not found in schools all around the nation, but in particular neighborhoods. And what happens as a result of the police presence is that it turns too often a school dispute into a criminal matter and uh, this is a real manifestation of what people refer to as the school to prison pipeline. I would also say that uh, you know, school shootings are incredibly high salience events um, and, uh, and deeply upsetting. 
Uh, it's also important to bear in mind the extreme unlikelihood of a school shooting affecting a particular school. There's polling data that suggests that people dramatically overestimate the likelihood that this is going to affect their own school. That is to say, I found a statistic that suggested that any given school can expect a school shooting once every 6,000 years, right? And that's not the number that would spring most readily to mind. Uh, and so uh, I want to have sensible gun regulations, and I think that that would be uh, the most effective way of addressing these issues. So I'll leave it there. One of the things that we've been talking about in our class together has been the, pro the, the proper way to think about the exercise of judicial power. And you, I don't remember exactly the term you used, but I remember one of them was Lilliputian. Mm -hmm. uh, and the alternative was, was whatever the opposite yeah. of Lilliputian. Might right. be. Can you talk a little bit more about how we think about the exercise of judicial power? Yeah, that's a very helpful question for those listening who may not be able to hear it. The question was about the nature of judicial power and judicial review. And my own academic work is very much participating in an ongoing conversation about the efficacy of Supreme Court decision making. And I've got to back up a couple of generations in order to tell you where my own stuff fits in. At the heyday of the Warren Court and thereafter, many people made broad claims about the Supreme Court's ability to, in effect, mage wave a magic wand and transform the American landscape. And there were these big claims about, say, the Gideon uh, decision changing the transformation, changing the legal landscape. And uh, the generation after the Warren Court devotees came along and said, wait a minute, these claims about the court transforming the entire nation are wildly overblown. Brown versus Board of Education, they say, should be understood as checking a regional outlier in effect, right, rather than getting rid of racial segregation all across the schools, that this is a southern phenomenon. Um, and so uh, they uh, say that, including my colleague at the University of Chicago, Professor Rosenberg, that the Supreme Court and the federal courts are a hollow hope, uh, that the federal courts are more or less uh, powerless to be able to lead transformation. Uh, they need the backup of the Congress. So, um, you know, I try to step in and try to identify some capacious middle ground between what I think of as these two polar views. The Warren Court generation, I think of as viewing the courts as omnipotent. The generation prior to mine, I think of as a view of the federal courts as being impotent. And I suggest that the Supreme Court is a potent institution, right? One that is capable of defending minority rights and uh, shaping our constitutional order in significant ways, um, often, not always, but often uh, in, in, in beneficial ways. I don't say that it invariably has done so, but I do resist this idea that the Supreme Court is simply marching in lockstep with the American people and is simply a mirror for the larger views in American society. I don't think that maps on to what's actually happened, and the school cases uh, bring its counter-majoritarian capacity into sharp relief. It does, you made the point that had, had Reed dissented, it, there might have been a very different kind of response. Does that fit into that, the, the story that you're telling there about the potency? Yeah, I think, that it, I think that it does. I do cast doubt on the cult of unanimity that surrounds Brown versus Board of Education. Some people do assert that they say one of the reasons that Brown was so effective is because it was unanimous. But the trouble with that is well, how efficacious was the Brown decision, number one? Um, you know, uh, they also say that had uh, there been a dissent, then the South would have resisted Brown with greater ferocity, but of course, it seems to me that the South resistance was prunty ferocious without a dissenting opinion. And so exactly as you suggest, uh, had there been one or maybe even two dissenting opinions, it's at least plausible that the court would have had an ability to go at a uh, sort of more rapid pace in pursuing desegregation and even uh, racial integration. As I understand it, Justice Reed was able to extract, uh, you know, a lot of concessions 
for being willing to go along with the Brown mandate. And people, in my view, pay insufficient heed to the costs of unanimity rather than only the benefits of unanimity. What's the question I should have asked that I haven't? The one that this gentleman has right over here. Um, he has a question. Thanks. Thanks. Okay. Very informative. Okay. I'm wondering if we could, uh, if you would think about uh, moving from the schoolhouse gate to the campus quad mm. and ask um, whether or not you think it's defensible uh, and where you would go if you thought it defensible to talk about rights of access to public higher education mm, mm. and whether or not arguments for right of access to public edu higher education mm. would have bearing on current conversations regarding financing mm -hmm. for anyone qualified mm -hmm. uh, higher education, mm -hmm. sort of free access. Mm -hmm. versus mm -hmm. Do you see a connection and are there, what would you articulate as the basis for any right to access to higher education? Yeah, so for those listening at home, the question is about uh, the relationship between, in effect, elementary and secondary education and higher education, right? One of the goals I have in this book is to really focus on the K through 12 environment because law professors do lavish a great amount of attention on issues of, say, academic freedom or affirmative action in higher education, um, and too little, in my view, on the place that affects many millions uh, more individuals. And so I can think of a few different connections between K through 12 and higher education. One would be there's been a lot of controversy surrounding free speech on college campuses, right, about controversial speakers being invited to campuses and then an effort to sort of suppress that speech. Um, it's possible that there is a connection between the anemic protection that is afforded student speech in the K through 12 environment and then what happens in college campuses. That is to say that the insufficiently robust protections that are afforded to student speakers in the elementary and secondary school context, those students end up bringing with them to college campuses and uh, in my view are too drawn to uh, suppressing uh, legitimate speech. Um, you know, you might also think about the connection between the parents involved in community schools case and affirmative action in higher education. There is, um, uh, you know, some real skepticism of race conscious measures in the elementary and secondary school context. And I suspect that affirmative actions days are numbered in the higher education context. My old boss, Justice O'Connor, wrote an opinion in 2003 in the Grutter opinion involving the University of Michigan Law School, where she said, it's been 25 years since we validated affirmative action in higher education. We don't expect that we'll need affirmative action in another 25 years. Now at the time that she wrote this opinion in 2003, many members of the civil rights community thought, oh no, 25 years is no time at all, uh, you know, that's, that's too short a window. Here we are nine years away from 2028, and I think that many proponents of affirmative action would leap at another nine years of affirmative action because they think that the court as currently composed is poised to get rid of, um, er, to get rid of it. Uh, so that's what I'd say about that. I believe the role of liberty is in a democracy and furthermore what role you think the court should take in defending that liberty. Obviously there's the constitution in exile uh, proponents who believe the court should be active and take on a, a very aggressive uh, you know, judicial activism type role in protecting liberty to take us back to the Lochner era. Then there's more pragmatic people who believe that uh, we should have the court solve uh, problems in, in the law uh, with uh, allowance for a little bit of a degradation of liberty. Mm -hmm. And then there, of course, are the originalists who believe that they should take a more neutral stance and defer to the legislature mm -hmm. and only overrule constitutional or only overrule uh, statutory law when it is clearly a violation of constitutional mm -hmm. right. So when, I'm sure you've had your fair share of debates about mm -hmm. this. 
throughout your years. Mm -hmm. When you approach, because um, I, I identify more as a pragmatist myself, so mm -hmm. I believe that the court should use its potency to try and right the wrongs that it can. When you approach somebody who, who comes with a more libertarian or the mm -hmm. more originalist uh, perspective, what would you, uh, how do you respond to that? I guess what I'm also asking before that is, what is your jurisprudence? Yeah. And then, uh, how, do you how do you approach this? It's a really thoughtful question, and uh, it's a testament to the very solid foundation that you have in this area, that you're able to see broad swaths of uh, you know, jurisprudence through this uh, you know, sort of overarching framework. How I think about this is indebted to the way that Justice Jackson would think about these questions, including in the Barnett decision, where uh, he would say that when it comes to the Bill of Rights and say the 14th Amendment, uh, that we do not put up those rights to a show of hands or a counting of noses, that uh, it is one of the features of our constitutional order that we remove some items from the rough and tumble of ordinary poli politics, and it's precisely for that reason that they are part of the Constitution itself. And so, rather than viewing, uh, you know, counter-majoritarianism as a bug, uh, Justice Jackson would, in you know, today's parlance, view it as a feature, right? That it is precisely uh, the constitutional order that prior generations, uh, you know, sort of set these items apart, including the freedom of speech and equal protection or unreasonable searches and seizures. And so um, I understand people I think of as judicial restraint, thinking back to you know, Thayer and Frankfurter and Holmes and these sorts of folks who were drawn to, uh, you know, uh, allowing the, these matters to be decided in the world of politics. I think that the judiciary has uh, necessary and indispensable role to play. It would be my hope in, in the best of all worlds that these sorts of matters would be handled in the political sphere, but as I see it, those items are often not addressed in the political sphere and so it leaves no choice but for the judiciary to step in in order to make sure that those rights are vindicated. Fantastic. Okay. We've worked you overtime. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Thank you. My pleasure. Thanks a lot. Really enjoyed it.